Let me ask you a question, Nathan. Should we invest in every deal, try to time the market, or just wait and ride out every economic storm? Which approach unlocks the greatest wealth for multifamily investors? Before you answer, I just want to tell everyone that this episode explores the differences between market timing and timing the market in investing. So just stay tuned as we dive into decision-making, the diversification strategies for buffering risk, and the game plans for achieving monumental long-term returns that can set you up for life. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the podcast. All right. Well, welcome, Nathan, and let's get to it. Awesome. Thanks, Robbie. Yeah, I don't want to jump the gun, but we'll get into kind of the answers and why I think investing in almost every deal or practically every deal makes a lot of sense, um, especially in this market. Okay. So let's just talk about the basics. Like, what does it mean to time the market? Yeah, sure. So trying to time the market is really trying to predict future price movements and then buying and selling assets or investing or not investing based off of trying to maximize returns. In this kind of industry, the classic saying is buy low, sell high, as is the case for most investing. And that's kind of the whole idea is that you try to time the market so that you're buying at a low point and you're selling at a high point. Um, and in contrast to that, you have time in the market, which is a little bit different. It's more kind of a, of a buy and hold strategy where assets are held longer term, um, despite kind of short term headwinds or fluctuations. Okay. So there's sort of two different strategies, but then they also could be used concomitantly. Like you're obviously you, you want to buy low and sell high, and, you know, and maybe you also want to time the market as well. So for those investors, and obviously most of us are that investor this way, they just want to buy at a time that makes the most sense. How how do they know that? What are the key challenges that investors face when attempting to predict? These yeah, functions? sure. So a lot of people think that investing in general is always up and to the right, meaning that prices always appreciate, values always go up. And that is true, but it depends on kind of the time frame that you are looking at, right? There's this great video, if you haven't watched it, it's on YouTube, it's by Ray Dalio, and it's about how the economy works like a machine. And essentially what he says is there's these long-term cycles that are traditionally up and to the right, but there are always kind of these, these short-term fluctuations where prices will increase and decline. And kind of the whole, I guess, point of, of buying is that you don't buy at a high point when prices are at all-time high, and sell at a low point, right? Because then you're you're always going to be losing money. And so you, you're trying to, as you said, right, have those two strategies almost work in, in unison with each other, where you are buying low, you're still able to kind of weather the, the short-term fluctuations. And then ultimately, when the prices do appreciate, when the value of your, your asset does go up, that's when you're able to sell, um, even if there are those short-term fluctuations in between those, those two time periods. Okay. And, and let's just use an example because we're recently or we're, we are just going through a market cycle. So at the, at the or the, I should say a flux in the current market cycle, and we're recording this episode on July the 1st, 1st, 2024. And this is the post the post COVID era. Um, we saw a huge rise and then a very significant dip. And there were a lot of people buying as we were ramping up to peak pricing. Mm -hmm. And many of us that were continuing to buy, including Viking, bought at times where the properties hit a peak and we it's the deal still made sense. So how would an investor be able to determine whether it makes sense to invest in those times versus times like now where there are not many people buying at all but and I've said this multiple times this is this is the time to buy. This is like a potential once in a generation time where you can get some deals at a very low cost basis. Two different kind of markers that you can pay attention to. One of them is obviously going to be price per unit. That is kind of the most apples to apples comparison. And that's really just taking the sales price and dividing it by the number of units for that specific asset. And if you're tracking sales prices, or if you are reading reports about sales prices, you'll see that sales prices will, will rise and fall. And with that, you'll see a rise and fall in cap rates too, meaning that, that the price of the asset relative to the income that asset produces, right? And so when you see these kind of cyclical natures of cap rates compressing and expanding, and, and consequently prices rising and falling, you, you start to see this kind of pattern. And to your point, going back to an example, we saw record high pricing in 2020 and 2021, even in the beginning of, of 2022, when your know, debt was really cheap and you, you had double digit rent growth in some markets, supply was very limited, and there's a ton of demand. So that pricing was at an all-time high. I mean, because you, you, you compare those price per units that we saw just two years ago to call it 
2019, 2018 pricing, and it went through the roof. Similarly, you saw a lot of transaction volume happen around that time too. And then when, as is everything, what, what must go up must come down, as the Fed started to raise interest rates and debt started to get more and more expensive, you saw less transaction volume, you saw prices decline, you saw the occupancy rates drop, rental growth come back to normalization. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but there's always going to be an equilibrium, right? When you have a tremendous growth in one area, you're going to have a kind of normalization back to the standard. And that's really where you're talking about kind of those short-term fluctuations. That's really kind of where we're at now, where prices are starting to come down, I'd say back down to, to normalized rates. Um, interest rates haven't yet declined, but there's an opportunity now because we're almost, I'd say, at the bottom before prices start to dramatically increase as well. One, because you have the Fed potentially doing rate cuts later this year and moving into next year, you still have record high demand. And so with that, you have this period where things are a little bit say, tumultuous, but uncertain of how long they're going to last. But it is certain that inevitably those prices will will improve. And so if you're able to buy at the right cost basis, that's kind of a, a term that a lot of people use in the industry right now is, hey, this is a great cost basis play. It might not be a cap rate deal, but it's a great cost basis. And what that means is that the property might be not be producing a ton of cash flow right now, but you're buying this asset at a great discount, right? Just like going to Costco and you're able to, to buy what you could grow in a grocery store, right? At a 30%, 20% discount, same idea here. So if you're able to weather the, the short-term kind of fluctuations so that you're able to buy a discount and when you go to sell an asset, having a discount, if you're able to, to again, time the market correctly, you, you should see a really nice kind of profit when you go to sell. Yeah. So uh, that was a great explanation, Nathan. And I just want to stress a few points. So the I think the biggest point you made was the cost basis definition, because if you look at the cost basis of some of the assets that were purchased at the time of the peak, you would have realized that the price per unit is actually much greater than the replacement cost. And that's a way, that's another metric to look at. You know, there's a lot of different variables, a lot of different metrics to focus on, but you also look at the replacement cost as well. Let's use Phoenix as an example, because that's one of the markets that we're looking at. So the cap rates on certain assets in Phoenix went down to 3%. Now cap rates, remember, are the NOI, the net operating income over the value of the asset. So as the income uh, increases, the cap rate increases as the value of the asset um, increases, the cap rate decreases. So we were seeing cap rates in 3%, which is very low. That was the market cap for certain assets. The cost per unit of some of those assets were up to $700,000, $750,000 per unit. Now think about it. How much does it cost to replace that asset? So if you bought land there, how much would it cost to build an apartment complex to replace the one that you're buying? And it would not even come close to that much, to that amount of that difference. So you can imagine with the developers, how much money they're making on every deal. Like it would cost them maybe three fifty, four hundred thousand dollars to build a complex per unit. And, and they were selling it at, at like at $700,000 a unit. So it was a massive gain. So you can imagine there's a bunch of development happening. There's a lot of transactions happening. Why were people even thinking that they could make this work? Well, because the interest rates were so low, right? And if the interest rates are so low and they're even lower than the cap rate, you call that positive leverage. And oftentimes you will still get cash flow. And if you project the, the asset as having that interest rate for that amount of time, and then maybe you sell at like you know, a little higher cap rate, then you'll be in great shape. And so these deals actually look like they penciled out. People are like, oh yeah, I want to, this still makes sense to buy. But what people didn't really project, and especially in areas like Phoenix, was that cap rates would go up so much, like not, not just 10 bips, but 200 bips. That means that the price, the market cap goes up, the price of the asset suddenly declines rapidly um, because the cap rate went up and um, the deal no longer makes sense. People are turning in the keys. That's what happens um, in certain areas. So to your point, cost basis is very important to look at, especially now when you're looking at assets at this time period, you can really see how low the cost is compared to how it was previously. Um, you're looking at cost basis, you're looking at cap rate, and you are trying, and you're not, you may not necessarily get cash flow during that time because the cost basis is so low, you may not be cash flowing well, but if the cost basis is low enough, you can, you can kind of extrapolate that selling in three, four years when the economy stabilizes would bring you a lot of value. Yep, absolutely. It's kind of like the, it's kind of the game plan for most new construction, right? So you don't have a ton of, of cash flow early on, but there is a lot of appreciation because you're buying at that discount, right? And that's kind of going back to time in the market versus time in the market. The whole point of being in the market is reducing risk, right? Because when you're trying to time the market, it's difficult to predict the turning points of cycles, 
right? You could be sitting on the sidelines where you do have cash, but you're kind of waiting for the right time and you might miss opportunities. You might only buy and, and sell during certain market cycles and, and you're missing opportunities, right? And, and that's kind of the whole point of being in the market is one, you can experience, hey, how is the market fluctuating? You can experience it in real time, which is something I think is also important too, right? There's a lot of reports that come out and they're always, hey, two quarters ago, this happened, or last year, this is where pricing was. But being in the market, you're able to see real-time fluctuations in pricing and negotiations and how many offers are coming in. And you just don't get that same kind of level of, of nuance when you only see on the sidelines and only investing at certain time periods. Yeah. And, and to your point, another story that I heard in the past, and I'm thinking about one particular sponsor that I know well, is that he was sitting on the sidelines for many years, like in 2014, 15, 16. He was like, the prices are high, cost basis is too high on these assets. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. And he waited and waited. And guess what? He lost tremendous opportunity because those were the times to buy and prices went up like to, to values that people didn't even realize they could go up to. So it's really hard to know when that peak is and when that trough is. And you just, it's, if you're investing, what I would advise, and I want to hear what you think, Nathan, but I would advise people to put a little bit into every different assets, a little bit into different assets. Like don't put all your eggs in one basket because if things do go down south, you could lose big. But if you put a little bit and, and everyone, it's like dollar cost averaging over time, you're going to come out strong. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's kind of like a combination of dollar cost averaging and diversification at the same time. Where you're you're investing little by little, and granted, not every asset, not every sponsor, not every deal will perform exactly the same. But there are certain buying strategies, even a seller's market when prices you know are nearing an all time high. There still can be some deals that make sense, right? When I when I think about kind of the different market cycles of of buyers markets and sellers markets, and kind of who has the most favor in each of those markets, the reality of the situation is that there's always going to be two different parties that are transacting. There's always going to be a buying side and a selling side. So even during sellers markets. There are buyers out there that are buying those assets. And it's just about weathering kind of the short-term fluctuations. Because let's say going back to, to 2021, 2022, when, when prices were at an all-time high, there were still a, bun a, a bunch of companies that bought and say, hey, the prices and occupancy and the value of, of the property probably will take a decline in the next few years. But if we believe in the location, if we believe in the opportunity of the asset, right? There is tremendous upside to be had. We just have to weather the storm. And and it's a different buying strategy when it's a buyer's market and there's a bunch of, of competition on the other side of the deal. It's, it's all about kind of just, just tailoring your strategy. That's kind of the one thing that I really like about always being in the market is that you're able to get more experience. Because if, if I'm, let's say I'm an investor, I'm only you know, buying when it's, it's an all-time low. I don't have the experience or the kind of acumen when, when things don't go right and I can't buy an all-time low to really kind of put my money to work. Yeah. And you're going to miss out. You know, yep. miss out on certain deals. Um, and that's why I say, and I'm I'm a very conservative investor. And that's what I say. I say just a little bit in, in every one, because you just don't know what makes sense and what doesn't. Now, there are certainly times where it makes a lot more sense than others. And, and I can tell you that like, this is one of those times, but so can you describe Nathan, why investing now makes more sense than maybe investing a couple of years ago, just now that we have that hindsight? Yeah. So in hindsight, we had, again, all-time record high pricing and all-time uh, record high rent growth, at least in the multifamily space. And so it seemed like everything was going great. That's when kind of all the fish are in the sea, so to speak. That's when everybody's investing, right? When everything's looking great. When things aren't looking great, I forget who said it, but when there's blood in the streets, that's the time to kind of invest. So when, when, there's, when there's fear in the market and you kind of zig one another zag, when there's fear in the market and, and everybody's kind of sitting on the sidelines, that actually presents a tremendous opportunity to get ahead of other buyers. Specifically right now, institutions have specifically been dealing with sidelines for the past year or so. Pretty much across the, the board, all REITs had negative returns in this past year. And so they're a little bit more kind of hesitant to, to invest, especially those, those large dollar amounts. But now that pricing is hitting almost a bottom, I'd say, and we're seeing a lot more deal flow and there's a lot of kind of speculation about the, the rate cuts that are going to come in the future. Now's the time to kind of get things at a discount before those larger institutions come into into the market before you start to see potentially a little bit higher rent growth than we've seen in the past year or so. And before kind of everybody gets wind of, hey, things are kind of going back to normal and things are looking a bit better. Now, granted, there are going to be some supply issues that are going to hit the market. There is a lot of supply that's coming to the market and that's going to dampen pricing and, and, and occupancy. And I don't think it's going to be as as sharp a tick up as some people might think. I don't think it's going to look like that Nike swoosh where it's like immediate up and to the right. I think it's going to be more of a gradual growth, but that plays out well for specifically multifamily because Unlike other asset classes where you can, but you only kind of realize your gains when you sell, like when you're thinking about like a stock, when you buy low and you sell high, 
You might have some dividends in between, but really kind of you make your money when you sell. My multifamilies, you get cash flow in between then. So even if you don't sell in the next year, two, three years, rather than sitting on the sidelines and not having that cash flow for three years, I'd rather invest in an asset that is producing at least some cash flow rather than having my 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 cash just kind of sit in a bank account or in a high yield savings account. So that, that leads me to the, the next question is, can you discuss some of the key factors that contribute to the stability of multifamily assets over the long term? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I mean, one thing go going back to what I just said is demand. So demand, at least kind of in the recent history, has been there. There's about four and a half million units that still need to be delivered to the market to meet up with demand. So there's kind of an inherent demand baked into one multifamily currently, but also multifamily long term. Shelter is always is always going to be a demand for the populace. Same thing, I was, I was watching this this video by um, Alex Ramosi. Those of you who know him, he's a, he's a guy who started a bunch of gyms and now has gone to start acquisitions.com. But he was saying like those staple businesses like real estate, like insurance, those businesses that one person won't skip out on payments or at least traditionally, right? Like like rent, like their insurance, like their car payments. Those are long-term businesses that have been around here for hundreds of years. And the reason that they've been around for hundreds of years is because they produce cash flow, they produce profit. Secondly, you have a diversified tenant base too, right? Unlike other asset classes, multifamily, you have a variety of families of people of different jobs that are all plugging into that income stream. So even if you have a few vacancies, or even if you have a few tenants that don't pay rent, the majority of your community, hopefully, right, does pay rent and can able to kind of help sustain that cash flow, even if you have those those short term fluctuations. And then you know, lastly, they say that a multifamily is really kind of recession resilient, oftentimes during recessions, and periods of economic downturn, home ownership specifically decreases, and that, again, increases the demand for rental properties. And then kind of stacking on top of that, it's also a great inflation hedge because multifamily oftentimes appreciates alongside inflation. So just as the prices of food and gas and everything have gone up, so have the prices of rent. And if you're a landowner if you or if you own real estate, that means that the price of the rental rates that you're getting have also gone up and, and can combat that inflation, especially with short-term leases too, right? If there aren't these five, 10 year long leases like you see in retail, there are six to 12 months typically where you can reset at market rates depending on what the market's doing. Yeah. And, and that hedge actually helps with the issue of selling during down times. Because if you have the debt in place where you can actually hold the asset for longer and the economy does shift, and like the prices have dropped a bit and it doesn't make sense for you to sell. You, you still have that ability to turn the rents, you increase rents as, as an inflation hedge and you're getting that cash flow and you just hold it. And, and that's what we're doing for our assets that we bought during peak, or peak times is we, got, we have to hold them longer. Mm -hmm. The beauty of multifamily is that these assets um, will recover over time. And that's typically how, it, if you look over the, the decades that we have data about multifamily and, and investments and the economy and all of, all of that over time, it's easy to see that as things fluctuate, there still is a fluctuation upward. And that's what you are counting on. So certainly at any given time, you might see fluctuations. You might not want to sell, or uh, maybe it's the time to sell or what have you, but then over time, things will sort of improve. And that's what you count on. Yeah. Yeah. And the whole point of, I was asking about this, the whole point of investing is to keep momentum, to keep your, your money moving forward, right? I often say that that life is about movement. When things start to stagnate, that's typically when they die. And so you expect fluctuations, expect things to change, right? Nothing in this life is certain except for change. So if you can weather the storm and have the knowledge to really kind of be in the market and, and have optionality for holding these long-term or selling when the, when the, when the market is ripe for opportunity, that's really kind of the best of both worlds. Now, obviously a lot easier said than done, but that's kind of the, the whole goal that we're, we're aiming for. Excellent. Well, um, this was a great discussion, Nathan. What other tip strategies can you add before we finish up? Yeah. So investing is always kind of a, a psychological game, right? And a lot of investing feels very emotional, but if you can take the emotion out and really focus on strong economic fundamentals like jobs, population growth, rent growth, seeking markets where, where supply, there's supply constraints or, or demands outweighing supply, that's really where kind of the rubber meets the road and really where deals make a lot of sense. Obviously, people always say this underwrite conservatively, underwrite what seems realistic. And two, have justification for why you're underwriting the way you are. That's the whole point of underwriting. It's not to make kind of assumptions, but to use data to really accurately project future pricing. So maintain discipline, um, diversify. I'd say get your money moving for you, right? If you are 
kind of nervous about investing, reach out to experts. We have a great team at Viking who can help educate you, but also just be familiar with what you're investing in too, right? That's the whole kind of name of the game where, where you can only buy low and sell high when you really know what you're investing in. But when you are kind of in the market and you have that expertise and you are investing in deals and maybe different deals with different sponsors or different kinds of asset classes, the more you're able to build up that resilience and that, that kind of knowledge base, um, the better off you're going to be regardless of what, what market cycles are to come. Because inevitably they are going to come. It's just a matter of, of when, not if. Yeah. And I would encourage those listeners out there that have other deals with other sponsors to bring them to us to evaluate. You can ask other sponsors about our deals, but use the investor relations team at the various firms to your advantage, right? Because our team is always willing and able to talk to whoever wants to. And we've done that actually. I, I know that we've, I talked to our IR team every, uh, several times every week, and they always mention that people ask them about like a, even a single family rental or maybe a small multifamily that they're thinking of buying or other sponsors deals. And we will help, help you evaluate those deals and go through them. And then we'll show you our deals and show you how they differ or how they're similar. So uh, it's just another tool for you to use if you choose to do so. So uh, that concludes our discussion. Thank you, Nathan. This was uh, very insightful. And uh, I hope you as listeners got a lot out of it. Awesome. Thanks, Ravi. See you next time. If you like this podcast, please hit subscribe or a thumbs up and we'll see you next time.